let me uh, let me welcome all of you. Let me welcome all of you today to the Peterson Institute. Uh, this is a great personal as well as professional pleasure today to host Bill Rhodes, uh, whom I have known and worked with now for uh, at least 40 years. Not his entire career, which is even longer than that, but uh, for a good chunk of it. Uh, his new book is entitled Banker to the World, and that, I think, is a, an accurate description of Bill Rhodes. Uh, for over 50 years, he has really been banker to the world. Um, one of the uh, reviews of his book called him the point man for U.S. banking for five decades of crises involving the national finances of a variety of nations, and then many are listed. And I think that's quite accurate. Um, Bill has played that role literally for over 50 years and has uh, been in the middle of virtually every debt crisis uh, since that, uh, over that period. Uh, another reviewer called the book a career memoir by a man in the middle of everything from 1957 to the new millennium. And I think that is accurate as well. Uh, Bill, in short, has been Mr. International Finance, uh, not just in this country, but globally, uh, through a period that started with uh, what now look like very minor blips in the global financial scene, like Nicaragua and Jamaica, where he and I interrelated back when I was at Treasury in the late 70s, uh, but escalating since that time. Uh, Bill has been, uh, is now, uh, remains a senior advisor to Citibank and Citigroup. Uh, he was for many years uh, its, uh, its vice chairman, its senior international officer, and uh, in his role at Citi, uh, literally led the financial groups uh, organized among U.S. banks that responded to this range of crises. Um, he began, as I say, in the late 1970s. Um, he was active in the 1980s, working closely with Paul Volcker, who wrote the foreword to his book, uh, Jacques de la Rosier, in responding to the Latin American debt crisis of that period. In the 90s, he headed the advisory committees of international banks that did the debt restructuring agreements for Argentina, Brazil, Jamaica, Mexico, Peru, Uruguay. In 1998, when Korea had its banking and and uh, currency crisis. He chaired the International Bank Group that negotiated the extension of its short-term debt. In 1999, at the request of the Brazilian government, he was global coordinator to implement the maintenance of trade and interbank lines by banks to Brazil, and so it goes through the period. He's been in the middle of all of them. Uh, Bill remains very active in a host of um, uh, activities, both still at Citi and in the banking world, and in uh, a whole series of non-governmental organizations, Institute of International Finance. He's Chairman Emeritus of the Americas Society and Council of the Americas. He remains Chairman of the U.S. Korea Business Council, where he's played a very active role in trying to promote congressional approval of the free trade agreement, which we hope is getting closer, though we've said that before. We hope now it may happen. Um, it's a great pleasure, as I say, to host Bill here at the Institute today. He's going to draw on this vast experience and expertise to talk to us particularly about the current debt crises in Europe and elsewhere, and to help guide us out of them as he has helped guide us out of so many others over the past few decades. Bill, it's a great pleasure to warmly welcome you to our podium. Uh, Fred, this is an, uh, an institute that I have admired tremendously. I have a lot of friends here. There are a lot of friends in the audience. I told Fred if I start naming those of you who are good enough to come who I've worked with over the years, I'd never get through. Uh, Bill Klein just gave me his, his latest book, and certainly on the debt side, uh, there's no economist who's followed this more closely than he. As Fred said, he and I started working together when he was Assistant Secretary and Under Secretary of Treasury. And those were the easy days, I guess, Fred, to, to work things out with Nicaragua, with Daniel Ortega, who, by the way, is back again, and he hasn't changed one bit, except now, instead of being Castro's best friend, uh, he's Chavez's best friend, but uh, that's the only thing that's changed. 
we'll see if we have a free election there again for president. As you know, he, he had one free election. He lost to Villa today tomorrow. And uh, one of the things about Jamaica, which you and I always said at the time, with all the problems and everything else they had, they've always paid their debt. They've never reneged on their debt. So uh, I appreciate the time there. And, and uh, seated there next to him is, is George David, who is a, a director of city. And uh, without going into the details, uh, when, uh, he and I were two of those who spoke up uh, <coughs> very strongly. And he was a backer when I came out with my op-ed in March uh, 07, saying the markets were going to blow. And uh, <coughs> I really appreciate uh, George's support, uh, great uh, CEO of United Technologies. And I, I say, Fred, a great supporter here. Be exactly. And uh, he and I kept trying to work city to make a, some decent contribution here financially. It wasn't easy. But I must say he tried very hard, and I appreciate him coming all the way from New York. As I said, there's so many friends here. I'm not going to run through everything, but I'd just like to thank you for coming up. Also, Fred mentioned uh, Korea. And of course, Fred's been involved in Korea since day one and been so important uh, giving advice on the growth of that, uh, of that economy. And he then and I started working together most recently on this free trade agreement and, and supports us on economic data at the US-Korea Business Council. Uh, not a happy chapter for the US government, I must say. Uh, we approved it in July 2007. And here we are, President Liam Bach, still hoping that, the, that President uh, Obama is going to send it to Congress and get approval before he comes here on the 12th of October. Let's hope so. Uh, <clears throat> what I've uh, tried to do in the, in the book, uh, Banker to the World, and I was urged by a number of senior members of the IMF and people in the banking community and governments to sit down what I saw as a record, because uh, I remember Stan Fisher once told me years and years ago when he was first deputy managing director, he said, you know, people forget easily. And I, and I see that uh, particularly on the part of the Europeans. So I, I thought I'd start with giving some of the lessons that, that I learned all through this period. Uh, and right up until uh, this pre present decade, uh, working on uh, uh, countries like Uruguay, uh, Turkey, Iraq, etc. First of all, <clears throat> which seems ba very basic to a lot of you here, is there's no cookie cutter approach. Every country is different. And uh, you'd think that that be well understood after all these lessons, but uh, some of the early pronouncements out of Brussels, you wouldn't think so uh, after uh, Greece uh, uh, started to blow. And I think this is very important because obviously Greece got into the problem uh, because of uh, fiscal deficit plus two administrations, one conservative, one socialist, uh, before it sort of hiding the figures. And then uh, Papandre, who's a, a very straight person came in and announced in December what he found of 2009. And that began all of this. And uh, they managed to drag in the Greek uh, banking system, which really wasn't in bad shape. Uh, then we go on to Ireland, and it was the banks, because the fiscal situation of Ireland, as most of you know, is in pretty good shape. But they made that critical, disastrous mistake of guaranteeing the banks without knowing what was in the banks, a failure regulation failure of regulation in the country and also uh, on the part of the politicians. And then Portugal got in there because Portugal really has had no growth for the last 10 years. And the banks got dragged into that at the end with the government pressuring the banks to take their, their paper. Uh, Spain, different situation. Uh, Spain basically has two problems. One is, again, the housing situation, which we had here, the Irish had, and uh, they have very much with their savings uh, banks. Uh, reminds me some of our savings and loan. Uh, and they didn't want to recognize this. Now they're in the process of, of closing them, in, in, you know, uh, <clears throat> intervening them, and very much trying to uh, consolidate them. Uh, and so uh, this process is, is, is time consuming, and the initial estimate of, of 20 billion euros by the Zapatero government, I think, is going to be more like 40 to 50 billion euros by the time uh, that it's, uh, it's done. Rodrigo Rato is, is one of the key players trying to put them together. As you remember, he was a former 
managing director of the International Monetary Fund. At the same time, uh, the Zapatero government got in there, and uh, I wouldn't quite say they spent like drunken sailor, but uh, I mean there, were, there wasn't much in the way of controls on the deficit, etc. This government, <clears throat> over the last year or so in particular, has taken some, I think, very strong measures on the austerity side. And one thing I have to say <clears throat> for both parties in, in Spain, they were able to get together on the deficit, and you very rarely see the Partido Popular, which is a conservative party, which will probably win the next elections in November, uh, but, uh, and the Socialist Party get together on that. And I think it's a sign of the responsibility uh, in Spain that something has to be done. So some of the pressure has been taken off of Spain. And of course, a year ago, people thought Italy would muddle through, it always does. But as we all know, Berlusconi, who the prime minister, and Tremonte, his finance minister, don't even speak to each other. They dislike each other intensely. And that played out uh, right through the summer. And Italy has 120% of uh, debt to GDP. There was always a problem in there. The banking system basically has recapitalized a lot of itself after the problems they got into in Eastern Central Europe. And so we don't have a... Uh, Irish type situation among the Italian banks. But the question is, these austerity measures that they've gone back and forward on with the budget, uh, they've now been passed, the latest version. And the question is, it's one thing as the Greeks and others are finding out to say you're going to do something, our own country, uh, on the deficit, and another to actually do it. And so we have to see what happens in Italy. But Italy has been hard hit, uh, which forced the ECB and I must say, John claude Trichet is pillared because he went in, you know, uh, unlike uh, a, a good German central banker and started buying bonds there as well as the other three countries. But he felt he was let down by the politicians a year ago about this time in Deauville, who he thought would step up on the fiscal side and, and take measures, and they didn't. So he felt that he had to intervene, although his major job is price stability, and start buying up bonds. It's not something he wanted to do, but he felt he did. So I kind of picture him all the time as Atlas holding the Eurozone uh, together until the politicians can finally do something. Let's hope uh, that that works out. The second uh, <clears throat> point, which is something really that bothered me, is, that, is, is, is on contagion. Because we learned about contagion, and there's a number of you who work through Latin America here, and we learned about contagion in Latin America. The Asians learned about it again. Uh, and then in, in, in this uh, past decade, this new century, we learned about it with Argentina and the spillover in, in, in Uruguay. And uh, contagion was something that I have, I don't know, it's either on my head or branded in my chest. Uh, that, that I learned, and when I tried to tell uh, policymakers, members of the ECB board, the politicians, uh, members of the Brussels bureaucracy who were in Davos in January 2010, that they better be concerned with contagion out of Greece, I was told, you know, Rhodes, you've been around too long. That might have been the case for the emerging markets, that, you know, we're Europeans. And, uh, you know, this isn't going to happen to us. And literally, uh, that was the feeling. And by the way, they didn't even recognize Greece was a problem. It took them until May to finally put something together with the so-called tro Troika, the EU, uh, ECB, uh, European Central Bank, and the IMF. And so uh, it really was very, very uh, frustrating because right up in, until Portugal had to be sort of intervened, in a sense, to be helped by this group, they were still in, in denial. Uh, and so it, it's amazing that the Europeans, I must say we Americans are guilty of this too, we can pontificate to the emerging markets, and we did it uh, for 20 years, and they come back and they say, well, you know, we did what you said, Washington consensus, all of these things. Uh, why don't you learn from our mistakes? Why do you have to redo them? And uh, I think it's a sign of two things on the part of the Europeans, both ignorance and arrogance. And of course, they had to learn the hard way. So contagion, I think, is now an accepted word. Every time you see a statement out of the politicians, the ECB, whoever, the bankers, 
And let me tell you, the European bankers were the same way because, uh, you know, their attitude was that we started all the problems with the American banks, you know, with the, uh, you know, <coughs> with the problems in mortgage lending, the securitization, uh, subprime and everything like that, and the poor European banks suffered. Well, you know, London's a financial center, and they have other financial center, and uh, they didn't want to take the steps that they should have been recapitalized because this was going to be just an American problem. That was the attitude in 2008 and 2009. Well, you know, we're in such an interlinked world that if one banking system has a problem or the sovereigns have a problem, it really hits us because the market now moves almost in nanoseconds. It's not like it was in Latin America in the early 80s or even in the case of Asia in uh, the late, you know, in 1997, 98. Uh, I mean, even long-term capital seemed to take a while to percolate in Russia compared to the movement you see now, how fast uh, things move. So I would say that that's one of the things that, uh, that bothered me the most. Another thing that I learned, and we have several members here of, uh, who are very active uh, at the Federal Reserve uh, in various periods, and one of the things that Paul Volcker told me early on in 1982, I was taken down to meet him because I'd never met Paul, and he said, you know, Rhodes, one of the lessons you've got to learn right off in crises is timing. Because you bankers don't have all the time in the world to sit around these committees and decide what you're going to do. Because, you know, this whole thing's going to blow up. And we don't need another Great Depression here. The big joke in Toronto uh, at the time of the IMF World Bank meetings in uh, 1982 was we were all rearranging the deck, uh, the deck chairs on the Titanic. So Paul taught me that, and, and it's one of the best le lessons I've ever had, which again, uh, I was trying to, to say to the Europeans is, you know, the, the longer you put off taking the tough decisions, uh, the, the worse it's going to be, the bigger the losses, et cetera. Even as late as June of this year, to a ranking official in the EU bureaucracy, et cetera, uh, when I made a comment at a group meeting in Switzerland, won't mention where the group, but I was told that I didn't know what I was talking about. Europe had everything under control. And when I said this is going to affect world markets, this is the beginning of June of this year. This is an idea of the attitudes. Uh, <clears throat> actually, I'll, I, as I said, I, I won't mention the group because we're not supposed to say we're the individual, but put it this way. You had this, almost all the senior central bankers of Europe sitting around at that table, among others. Uh, I, didn't, I, I must say a couple of them came up to me and said, you know, unfortunately, Bill, you're right. And Arminio Fraga was seat, seated there also. And Arminio said afterwards to me, he said he couldn't believe what he heard uh, after all of the advice he got when he was at the central bank in Brazil when they turned things around. Uh, <clears throat> I think another point is that is very, very important is that if you're going to have a successful program in a country, the leadership of the country not only has to take ownership, but they've got to sell it to their population. I like to give three examples, or there are many more uh, in Latin America and Asia. Uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso uh, took as finance minister in the early 90s, took uh, Brazil really out of the moratorium. I did the debt negotiation with him, and he and a team, all people you know, Arminio Fraga, Pedro Milan, Murillo Portugal, all of these people put together the Royal Plan. But it was a plan put together by Brazilians for Brazil. It wasn't something the IMF or the US or the Europeans imposed on them. And they were able to sell that program to the Brazilian people. And although they've had a few ups and downs in the meantime, you know, Brazil is a different country today. And of course, that led the way for Fernando Henrique for two terms of the presidency. And uh, with the help of Pelosi at the beginning, uh, Lula da Silva basically continued that trend. And I hopefully we're going to see the same with, uh, with Dilma, Dilma Rousseff. Um, case in point, someone many of you know well, because he was at the World Bank for all these years, Kamal Davis. He decided that in order to sell the program that he had put together uh, to a skeptical population in Turkey in 2001, 
And I must say to our Secretary of the Treasury, and I was asked by Horst Kohler to be an amicus curiae with Paul O'Neill, who said, I'm sick of you know what the Clinton administration did and those before, bailing out all these countries. We're not going to do that in this new, brave new world of the Bush administration. We're not going to do it. And I had to convince him that Kemal Dervis was going to sell us as a Turkish program and that he was going to take all of these upfront actions, which he did. And uh, he was able to convince the public in Turkey and the politicians that this was a Turkish program for Turkey, backed by the IMF uh, and uh, ver United States and various European countries. And so, you know, if a population sees <clears throat> that their people are putting it together, and it leads to growth. Uh, one of the successes of the Brady Plan, after years of trying to restructure and restructure <clears throat> and putting in new money, uh, Nick came along and said, you know, enough is enough. I was one of those he asked to come down and uh, the guy from the private sector to work with him on it, and I also then got the great job of implementing it. But uh, basically what Nick said was, we've got to get these countries back to growth. Uh, and the countries were pleading with them uh, to do this. And so you can't just have a program Greece, three years <clears throat> now in negative GDP. They started off with the estimates this year of 3.8, now they're 5.3 for this year, negative, and by the time it's through, maybe 7%, and it's not clear under the present arrangements there's gonna be any growth next year. How can you ask a people, particularly the Greeks, by the way, who are very independent, to be accepting that. So you've got to show growth at the end of the tunnel, which is one of the things that Brady Bond did. And you can't confuse the private sector deal that's on the table now with what Nick Brady put on the table then. It's not the, ain't the same. But I think that is so important. And because you've got to sell the public on this, because they've got to be supportive. And every survey I see from Greece, the, the public support goes down, down, and down. Uh, you know, you can arrange, you can sit down with the IMF, the Troika, and make all sorts of arrangements, uh, get the next tranche through, which is what's, gonna, what's happening now and what's going to happen. But the other thing is to get your population behind it. And uh, the other case I give is uh, Kim Dijon. This is a case that Fred knows well. He came in, in the Korean context, the extreme left. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> he got in the job because people uh, in Korea were fed up with what was going on vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, financial crisis. And I went to see him when he was president-elect because I had to get the banks in line, first of all, to stop pulling because the reserves were below a billion dollars and falling. Today the country, you know, has in the order of $300, $350 billion of reserves. Uh, and I had to convince him to support me. And he said, look, I don't like this IMF agreement, but he said, you know what? we cannot allow Korea to go into default. And he said, you have a job to do, uh, and I know you will do something positive, Korea. You have my full backing. So I was able to tell the banks that this new president from the left was going to back it, and he certainly did. I remember something Fred probably does and others of you. <clears throat> I saw women blocks long <laughs> in Korea at the Bank of Korea, the central bank, taking in their gold jewelry to melt it down. Now, I've never seen that in any country in the world. But <clears throat> when push comes to shove, you need the leadership. You gotta sell it to your people, and then anything's possible because the financing will be there. We managed to get the agreement in a month. Within two months, they were back in the market, raising $5 billion. Now, Korea's had some problems since, but basically, they've never stopped. Uh, and so I give credit to, <clears throat> to Kim DeJong, and I went to see his widow after he died, and she said, you know, Mr. Rhodes, uh, well, translate, because she doesn't speak English and I don't speak Korean, but she said, you know, uh, the president never liked this IMF program, but he knew he had to do it. And so sometimes you don't like to do it, but you gotta be out there selling it, uh, I think, to your, to your people. And I think that's, that is really key. I think another point <clears throat> is you, you've got to be able to bring in the private sector early on. Uh, because the private sector usually holds most of the paper. And if you want to get the country back to the markets, it's got to be done with the private sector. What you're having now, and you remember the famous cry 
that we had of the 1980s and early 90s, bailing out the banks. You couldn't read out an article until the Brady Plan came along that didn't talk about bailing out the banks. And uh, what you're seeing here is a transfer of private debt to public debt with the purchase of the EC, uh, you know, by the ECB of the bonds and other things. And at the end of the day, we've got to get the private sector back in to make investments and to get these countries back to growth. Obviously, it's got to be a partnership. Again, uh, Fred did that in his period of time between the uh, public and the private sector. But you've got to have the private sector in. I think it was a mistake to wait till this summer to get the private sector involved. And of course, some members of the private sector, the banks were very happy. I mean, if the governments were going to put in the money, uh, you know, and they could keep their paper at 100 percent, you know, hold a maturity, that was fine. But at the end of the day, you've got to have the two uh, in, uh, involved. So <clears throat> I would say <clears throat> the last thing that I would <clears throat> mention here, I think, is <clears throat> on, you know, on lessons learned, which is really a sum of everything I've said. You really need strong leadership. And up to now, we have not seen that anywhere, uh, I think, in Europe. I give credit to, as I said, to Jean-Claude, often criticized, uh, but he felt he had to do this to buy time with the hope that the politicians would come up with some uh, solutions. I, I should mention <clears throat> the so-called stress tests. Uh, one of the things that our Treasury did well and the regulators did well here, a lot of people criticize them for a lot of things, some of them correctly, they, they ran a tough set of stress tests two years ago. And banks increased capital substantially. That didn't occur in Europe. They decided they were going to have stress tests. And the first one was somewhere between a farce and a comedy, because they passed all of the Irish banks within six months they were all in the tank. They passed almost all the Cajas in Spain. And I've already gone over what happened there. And basically, almost all the Landis banking. And of course, the various uh, states in Germany have had to put in a lot of money into most of those Landis banking since then. So then they had a second stress test. This was to supposedly equal bars two years ago. And they kept postponing the date. First they were going to be out in March, then April, then May. Finally, we got the final figures in July. And uh, so everyone said, oh, this is, this is what we're go we really need you know, in the EU. And of course, uh, there had been a lot of capital raised, 100 billion euros for banks uh, since the first stress test. But there was one glaring problem here, among others. They treated sovereign bonds as sacrosanct. You didn't have to reserve against them. They weren't taken in the ratios. And of course, you now see what's going on. The argument of the International Accounting Standards Board, a number of the Europeans saying that haircuts have to, you know, in Greece have to be up to 50 percent. But, you know, we have to go back and recapitalize Christine Lagarde, first thing she said out in Jackson Hole uh, as a public speech after being finance minister of France for a couple of years, she said, we've got to recapitalize the European banks. And now you're hearing it all over the place. But, uh, you know, this is something, again, that I learned is when the sovereign's in trouble, the banks get into trouble. When the banks are in trouble, the sovereign gets in trouble. They're like this. It's like our interlinked world. Again, People didn't want to recognize this. So what are, what are they going to do going forward with the banks? I think in Europe, you're going to see a lot of Maori out there re, uh, you know, recapitalizing. I mean, you can't say all the banks are the same. You have some very strong international banks who well capitalized in Europe. But there are a number of them that need to be recapitalized. The whole Greek banking system needs to be recapitalized. And you remember the famous stability fund. And one of the things that Fred said, well, Bill, Instead of just you know, analyzing what went wrong, why don't you say what needs to be done? And one of the things that needs to be done is the stability fund has got to be approved. Now, this reminds me of the United States, the time of the revolution. You know, we had the, here we have 17, we had 13, the Confederation. Everyone had to have a, to vote. Uh, <clears throat> fortunately, we had a lot of politicians come on board, particularly Alexander Hamilton. But the point here, <clears throat> is that you've got to get every one of these countries to approve the stability fund, which will have the ability to take uh, off of the back of the, of the ECB, the bond buying. One of the big questions is, if you do have haircuts 
in Greece that are bigger than what's on the table or elsewhere. Is ECB, who's bought 200 billion, 250 billion uh, worth of, of bonds, uh, are, who's going to take the hit? Well, I don't think it's going to be the ECB, so I guess it's going to be the stability fund who will take over that role. But also, they will have the right to help recapitalize, the example, uh, the Greek banks. A uh, big vote on that is tomorrow in Germany. Uh, but I think there's still some holdouts. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the Finnish situation with collateral will be worked out one way or the other. But you need that stability board. And you remember when this pact was announced, July 21st, uh, this was going to solve all the problems. The market soared. And most of the people involved in it went on vacation. You know, Robert Tuckman's famous book, The Guns of August, uh, one of the best books I've ever read because uh, we had Mexico in August. If you take a look at World War II, if you take a look at the time differences, uh, that's when the Germans actually uh, invaded Poland. The first troops were across the border, border then. And, uh, you know, Russia, long term capital, also in August. So August seems to be a month where instead of people going on vacation, they should be hard at work. And uh, we didn't see that in Europe. And so <clears throat> the initial idea was we were going to get the stability fund approved middle of September, latest, latest middle of September, because everyone's going to come back and they're going to work like hell to get it done. Then it, go, it went to the end of September. The official line here this weekend was we're going to get it done by the middle of October. Let's hope so. Other people think it may take to the end of October, just in time for the con uh, G20 meeting, where again, everything's supposed to be resolved. Uh, well, I was in Korea at that meeting and nothing was resolved. Let's hope it's going to be more like London, where I give some credit to, to a guy that's always beaten up on these days, Gordon Brown. I think he did a good job there. And I think that was probably the one G20 meeting that really stood out. Let's hope the one in Khan coming up in November uh, does the same. So I think getting that stability fund approved is necessary. Whether they lever it or they don't lever it, they got to get it improved. Obviously, if you can lever the amount up, that's great, but you got to get it approved, first of all. <clears throat> the other thing is we all remember Maastricht, and you had the growth and stability pact, and that was going to be the opposite of the ECB. You know, they're going to be twins here, you know, monetary and fiscal. And uh, countries, in the Eurozone, all 17 now, there were less than, but they, they were going to be limited on their deficits to 3% of GDP. So who set the example? Who broke it first? The French and the Germans, which is a heck of an example, you know, for the smaller countries. And one of the things that uh, Pop and Dre and some of these others mentioned. So <clears throat> what we have is we don't have a structure. Here in the United States, we obviously have the structure, uh, the framework, the question is, do we have the will on the deficit? We're still to be tested, but they don't even have a structure over there. So there are all sorts of things being done, you know, in Italy, Spain, et cetera, but they have got to come to grips with what are they going to do on the fiscal side? Uh, John claude Trichet and others talk about a European, uh, you know, finance minister. <clears throat> you talk about having penalties. The Dutch are talking about it, a series of things, and if you don't adhere to it, you get thrown out. But at this point, <clears throat> there is no other side to the monetary union. And if it's going to succeed, they've got to do it. And as we say in Spanish, lo más pronto posible, as soon as possible. Uh, and they're going to have to get their act together. Now, sometimes, as Jacques de la Rosière used to say, he quoted a uh, not well-known French philosopher, things get done badly, but they get done at the end. And I think that's probably how this is going to turn out with, uh, with the Europeans. One of the other things that I wanted to mention is what's the role of the IMF? I did a piece in this emerging markets paper. They circulate uh, on the weekend at these <coughs> meetings. I was on page four, and I put forth the idea, and then uh, I gave an interview to Dow Jones, and the guy finally got around to putting it out yesterday. And there's been a, there was a very good op-ed by the former chief economist of the IMF <coughs> in yesterday's Financial Times, but I would do it a little differently than he would. I think that this, and I've said this to Christine Lagarde over the weekend, I said this is really the opportunity to turn the fund back to what it used to be, to making it the linchpin, the anchor of the system when there is a crisis. Uh, in the sense of crisis prevention, 
and uh, crisis management and helping countries uh, get out by being the anchor. And when I say the anchor, I remember in all those years, and those of you uh, here in this room, when we worked together on this, remember that it was the IMF who was the anchor with the private sector to get these countries out of problems. And <clears throat> Fred and I were talking yesterday about the Whitavin Fund and the role of some of the countries in the Middle East there in the Gulf area. And what I said to her was, you know, you ought to get the Chinese, because the Chinese aren't going to go off on their own and buy bonds. I was in, uh, <clears throat> what's it now, 10 days ago, 12 days ago, uh, I was sitting in one of the front rows there when Wen Jiabao gave a speech in Dalian at the World Economic Forum, and he made that pretty plain. But <clears throat> as an effort, <clears throat> what they could do is uh, we could put together a fund, a special fund, the Chinese, uh, Gulf countries, other uh, surplus countries, maybe even Korea, Brazil, since they're both talking about doing something this way uh, in this regard, <clears throat> that could be given to the fund to expand uh, their financing uh, uh, capability. Jacques de Rosier did it uh, at the time of the Latin American debt, debt crisis. He got on a plane and flew to Saudi Arabia and got the Saudis to put up uh, special funds for this. And so this would then give them the clout, the IMF, the clout with some special fund. And as I said, not just a fund to buy bonds, but a fund to support their programs going forward. Because right now you take a look at that troika and uh, who leads the Troika? It, in the minds of everyone, it's not the IMF. You got the EU and the ECB, and I got, God help us if we had to deal with the Troika in the 1980s and 1990s. We had one anchor, and that was the International Monetary Fund. Through all the problems we had uh, through those years. And so I think this is like the Chinese like to say, Weiji, crisis opportunity. In other words, the crisis is here, but it's an opportunity, I think, for the fund and the Europeans to really do what should have been done earlier. And let's hope they do. That's like I like to say about our super commission here. We'll see how that happens, uh, you know, how that falls out, whether this, is, this opportunity is taken or not. But certainly in this area, they should, uh, they, should, uh, they should do it. Just a couple of words on China. And of course, you have some great economists uh, in this institute, who know China so well. I'm on a, on a couple of committees and stuff with Nick Lardy, and I've done some things at university with him. But <clears throat> I just got back from, uh, from China. And of course, if you're here at the IMF World Bank meetings, you know, people forget that China's out there and that Brazil is out there and India, <clears throat> the emerging markets, because everything, all the attention was on two issues. 80% Europe and maybe 20% or 10% the U.S. And the world is changing. Uh, the emerging markets today have a lot more clout vis-a-vis -vis their percentage of GDP and their potential going forward uh, than the so-called mature economies. You know, Japan's trying to wrestle with not having a, a, a strong uh, prime minister since Kojimi left. So you've had five in, 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 in six years. And uh, notwithstanding, you know, you take into account their lost decade and a half, I'd say, uh, and of course what happened in Fukushima. And so, you know, there should have been much more attention on the, on the emerging markets. But I would just say that in the case, and I've made not as probably as much as Nick or some of you, but I've made 60 trips, I think 62 to be exact, uh, to China since I started traveling there in the early uh, 1990s. I know Fred started traveling there a lot earlier. And I think you've got several things going on <clears throat> in China. And remember, China uh, is the second largest economy in the world on overall statistics. Obviously, if you go to Western China, you wouldn't think so. Uh, and you go to the coast, and it's one world, and Western China is another world. But you have a major change in leadership coming up. And this change, I think, is going to be very, very important. In many ways, it could be more important than the change from Jun Zemin and Zhu Renji uh, to the present leadership, Hu Jintao and Wen Jibao. And uh, things can always change in China, but as of now, Xi Jinping, uh, who, by the way, most people feel had the back, very strong backing of all groups, in, including uh, Jun Zemin and Zhu Renji. And one of the things that I learned about China is after Tiananmen Square, 
the party wants no separation. Everyone's got to get on board. They don't want another Tiananmen Square. And they are coming in uh, in a little over a year. The first changes in the state council, their cabinet will be announced. Uh, one of the senior roles will be announced probably the end of uh, next month. It'll be a key one who fills that role because it's in the financial area. Uh, and I'm not talking about the governor of the central bank. I think Joshua Schwan will, will, will continue. But I think that <clears throat> this is going to be very important. And already you've got a lot of politicking going around. You can see it in, uh, in Dalian. Next to uh, Wen Jiabao, the premier, the most important person at that conference was, was none other than someone who's a resident of this city, Zhu Min. I mean, when you saw the, I did a couple of panels with him, I could, the rush after one of the panels, I could hardly get away with the Chinese press all over him. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's, of course, how China sees itself being a stakeholder, as Bob Zellick put uh, out to the world several years ago. And an example of that is Yu Min. Fortunately, he's a very good economist. He knows the world. And I think uh, he and David Lipton will be uh, good assets to, uh, to the IMF and to Christian Lagarde. But <clears throat> one of the things people tend to forget is if, if you study European history and German history, modern history, we all know about Weimar, hyperinflation, the rise of Hitler, et cetera, et cetera. What people tend to forget, unless they're China scholars, is the role of inflation in modern China. Because one of the things that uh, helped overthrow, along with many others, Chiang Kai-shek, was the hyperinflation that gripped <clears throat> China in 1944 and 1945. You know, the pictures of merchants in Shanghai with wheelbarrows full of currency bills. And the other was, in Tiananmen Square, uh, the party secretary, who was purged later on, uh, lifted price controls. And so prices were soaring up. And people tend to miss that that was one of the reasons for Tiananmen Square. It wasn't just the other reasons that are put on, on the table. And so <clears throat> I think in China, and Zhu Renji was a good example of this, used to always hark back uh, on the importance of inflation in modern China. And Wen Jiabao, some months ago, uh, made the comments been repeated 10,000 times or more <clears throat> that uh, uh, the tiger in China today is inflation and, in, and the tiger got out of the cage. So you see the People's Bank of China since October raising interest rates five times during a similar period a little longer, reserve requirements in the banks nine times. And at the same time, you've seen them starting to move the RMB. You know, they tied it to the dollar again during the crisis in 08, and then they released it again last year, starting to move that somewhat more rapidly, at least for the moment. But one of the key areas is the banking area, because the largest surge in bank lending, and I know Nick agrees with this, that I've ever seen in my lifetime was what started in 2008 with the state-owned banks in China. And of course, uh, they led everywhere. And uh, <clears throat> what we've seen as a result of that is a bubble in real estate, but also this tremendous surge <clears throat> in lending to the provinces and to the municipalities and to state-owned institutions. And some of that has to be reeled in. Now, I think the CBRC, which is a regulator in China, the banking system, has worked on uh, lending into the, into the real estate area, mortgage area, et cetera. So I think steps are being taken there. And then the Chinese discovered what helped us get into the problem, which is off balance sheet. Because, you know, everyone <coughs> during the middle of the last, uh, during the middle of this decade and earlier wanted off balance sheet if you were a bank because you didn't have to have the capital requirements. So everyone ran into off balance sheet. Either that or shadow banking, one or the other. And uh, so this, this has been a problem with the so-called trust companies. And in talking with MK when I was there 10 days, 12 days ago, he feels that they're taking strong actions on that. The most difficult thing I see right now is all this lending went to the municipalities and provinces, as, as to how to reel some of that back in. Uh, and it's a real challenge, I think, in this area, which is why you see this, all this commentary about the state-owned banks. But uh, the CBRC has been pushing, and the People's Bank, uh, and uh, including right up to the State Council, the Premier, have been pushing uh, 
the state-owned banks and the private banks to substantially increase capital. And it's not just because of the implementation of Basel III. It's to really to give them the cushion uh, so we don't have another problem of what happened 10 years ago with the non-performing where the state had to step in uh, and, uh, as you know, recapitalize the banks and they spun off their uh, problem loans into asset-backed uh, companies and, <clears throat> and sold them off. They don't want another repetition because the banks are so much larger today than they were 10 years ago. In fact, uh, ICBC is probably, if you look at capitalization or other areas, is the largest bank in the world. So 10 years ago, you didn't have a Chinese bank in that area. Now, several of the Chinese banks are the largest uh, banks in the world. So uh, it's very important that this thing is done. So that's one of the things you've got to watch, how that is uh, implemented. So you've got inflation. You've got this whole question of the fallout. As you know, wages in the coast are rising so fast that people are moving, you know, industries and uh, are moving out to Southeast Asia or moving into uh, uh, to the western uh, provinces. Uh, Sichuan province as an example. A lot of Guangdong's, you know, businesses started moving to Sichuan province because of, of the wages. But the biggest single thing impacting the Chinese people, and you got to remember that the sentiment of the Chinese people is very important, is the cost of food. It's rising 12 to 14 percent and particularly pork, which is a staple there. And so the question is, how do you reel all of that in? And this is at the midst of a change in leadership. So those are all things that need to be watched. And if, if anyone in this room thinks that China's going to bail out the world, like it pretty well did with 2008 with that stimulus, uh, because they started not only spending tremendously in their own country, but they pushed on the export side and the import side, the import side with commodities, Latin America, Africa, elsewhere, uh, that's not going to happen this time. They grew, China grew, average 10.5% the last 10 years. Uh, official figure this year is 9.5%, next year is 9. Uh, I think they could well grow at 8%, which might be better for this inflation problem, but Zhu uh, and GOE set the level, the minimal level of growth in China to be 7% to absorb the jobs and keep social stability. And so the big kick in China, the other one, is to uh, cut the reliance on exports. Uh, and they're going to probably up this, particularly given the problems uh, in the mature economies on growth. I think we're in stagflation uh, in a form, maybe not quite stagflation, but certainly stagnation here. And you're seeing that in Europe, much of Europe and Japan. And so they've got to reemphasize uh, the, uh, you know, the domestic uh, consumption and uh, get down that high savings rate. We don't have much of a savings rate. We're starting to. Uh, we had a negative savings rate for a long time, but they were up close to 50 percent because there was no social safety net. Now, they've got to work harder on the social safety net side and, and increase domestic consumption so they're not so reliant on exports. One of the problems with you know, our politicians keep pushing, uh, and correctly so, in a way, to push the Chinese to revalue. But their attitude is, look, we're so dependent still on exports that we can't afford to. Well, I think that they need to do it for their own good now with this inflation problem. And they've started to move the rate. Uh, it's not satisfying to us or the Europeans, but at least they're, uh, you know, they're, they're moving it. And uh, that's a big issue right within the state council because obviously you can remember certain members who were tied in the export <clears throat> industries would uh, you know, prefer no revaluation. They'd even like a devaluation of the RMB. Forget about a, a revaluing it. So that's a, all of these things are up in the air in the midst of a change uh, in leadership. So at this very critical moment in time, you do have that change in China, and you have to constantly keep uh, China in mind today on anything that happens. So Fred, I think I've overused the time you allotted me. So I think that's it. The only thing I haven't gotten into is the US economy. But as I said, I think it's in stagnation. I've been saying this, notwithstanding the optimistic scenarios the Federal Reserve was giving out in the first quarter. Uh, as you see, they've stepped back tremendously from that. Uh, but you know, I think the US consumer is caught between this high unemployment rate over 9% 
Uh, this uh, debacle we have in housing, which still hasn't bottomed out yet on the one hand, and then people say, forget about, including the Fed, forget about any inflation. Well, food's still growing over 4%, and the last time I looked, oil was still over $80 a barrel. And so the cons poor consumer is caught in between that, so it's no surprise consumer confidence is where, uh, is where it is. So we've got more than our own problems. You tie that into the deficit here, but one of the things, we're still a leader of the world. We're still a number one economy, and the only thing I would say is I remember during the days, Fred does, many of you do here, in Vietnam and Watergate, where everyone gave up on us and said the United States is through. I never believe we're through because we have a unique ability to bounce back, and I, I, I believe we will do it this time, notwithstanding all the glum news and uh, the, the battling among politicians or something. You see it better, more than I do because you live here in Washington. I'll just end it with that, Fred. Good. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that uh, enormously comprehensive uh, tour of the world economy, uh, not just now, but for the last half century. <laughs> um, let me just ask you one or two contemporary questions, then we'll open it up to the group. Um, you, you gave uh, a number of components of the response that you would advocate for the European crisis now. But you did not give us your remedy for the Greek sovereign debt itself. I knew that was coming up. <laughs> so, so how much restructuring is necessary, do you think, to restore solvency for Greece? And of the many models you've uh, uh, pursued in your life, which, if any of them, would you apply in this case? Well, as I start out by saying there's no cookie-cutter approach, every country is different. I think. Uh, in Greece, I think the major problem as a starter is whether this government, the present government, the Papandreou Venezuelos government, is going to be able to implement the program they've agreed to and constantly add on to. Because when you look at the size of the debt, any of the models I've seen, 150% of GDP, none of the Latin countries or the Asian countries had anything even close to that. So we have never seen that type of debt burden. And it took the Troika a long time to finally get around to extending maturities and reducing interest rates. But in the meantime, the debt was building up. And uh, you know some models even have this going before they turn the corner up to 170%. And so you have to question the ability to implement the measures that are being agreed upon. The other thing is you can't live on austerity alone, as I said. You've got to have some, uh, some push to growth, pro-growth, whatever. And the big problem has not been that the Greeks have not taken a number of serious measures on the austerity side, because they have, particularly given the history of, uh, of Greece since World War II. The problem is they haven't been able to move on the revenue side. And uh, one of them, I'll start off with, is tax collection. The big joke is no one pays taxes. Uh, you just pay the tax collector uh, for his own side account. And th that's a problem there. Uh, is the enforcement of, uh, of tax collections. And it's all the more difficult when you're in an economy that's going its third year of negative uh, growth. The other thing is they promised from the beginning to start an active privatization program. And not much has happened there. And so you've got to have the revenue side of the balance sheet there, and we haven't seen it uh, yet. The other thing, which I mentioned several times here, is that the Papandreou government, the now Papandreou Venezuelos government, uh, has not been able to convince the Greek people that this is in their interest and that there will be growth at the end of the day, uh, because most forecasts still have a negative growth uh, next year. And the most recent poll, which was published, I think, in the last couple of days, and all these polls, you know, some have validity, some don't, but uh, even if you throw a 20% margin uh, to the positive here, is that only 15% of the population supports the program. And so you can pass all these taxes. They've attached uh, the latest taxation to the electricity bills and the property tax, so they'll cut your electricity off. 
but people doubt that they're really going to do that because the unions, you know, that uh, that work in that field said they won't uh, they won't implement it. And so I guess the question here is, <coughs> will they have to call elections? Uh, the Conservative Party there is saying you've got to have a cut in taxes. You can't just keep increasing them, or you'll never get growth. As far as the restructuring models go. Uh, I would just say that <coughs> whatever you got to give, even with the changes made on, on July 21st, you've got to give Greece a longer uh, term to pay off its, uh, its debt, and you've got to give them lower interest rates on the official side. Uh, and uh, you know, on the bank side, uh, everyone's talking about reopening it. You know, that was one of the major issues here, to do a 50% reduction. We'll see what happens. Uh, you know, a lot's changed since July when this first one uh, was done. Uh, my own feeling is if that happens, I don't think there'll be any more collateral involved because I, I don't think the, uh, the public sector will put, uh, you know, the official sector, better said in the EU, will put more collateral on the table. But the main thing is they've got to get on with this. They've got to take some of these decisions. You can't have a crisis every time a disbursement is coming up. You know, in the automobile industry, uh, they worldwide started in, in Japan, but it's worldwide, is you have just-in-time uh, production. And uh, what I say in Greece is it's just behind time. It's always they're just behind where it ought to be on any of this. And that, that's the EU's fault, so, as well as the Greeks. So, I mean, they're in this together. Uh, Greece does not want to leave uh, the EU. I stood in, in uh, in, in, in the main square, constitutional square, because I happened to be on vacation in Greece, when they overthrew the colonels. And Karl Melis, the uncle of the, premier, uh, the previous prime minister, uh, basically said <clears throat> that this is our moment. I'm going to carry you in to Europe. And so I think 90 percent, 80, 90 percent of the population does not want to leave uh, Europe. And many of them equate that with uh, you know, with the Eurozone itself. So I think we have to get this thing put together and put together quickly. You can't just have this crisis every two minutes and adding on stuff that, uh, that they can't pay. Because what was the rationale of the Brady Plan? The rationale of the Brady Plan <coughs> was to cut interest and cut principal so the countries could get back to sustained growth. And you've got to have something similar here. But you know, remember, there was one advantage that the Brady Plan had and all these countries had. I use Uruguay as an example because we had Bradyized them. And uh, we issued the new bonds, and they lived up to their program. And they were at a big discount when the bonds went out in the market. But within less than a year, they were at par, and they were back in the markets because they basically lived up to their IMF programs. But these countries had one big advantage that Greece doesn't have. They could devalue their currency. And you always have to remember that. So this is why the revenue side along with the austerity side, is so important. Uh, and uh, I think both sides have got to be realistic uh, here and very shortly. So I think until that happens, uh, Greece will tend to have, even though it's such a small percentage of the Eurozone, is going to have this tremendous pull uh, on what's going on there. And, and you stressed <coughs> contagion in your remarks. Do you think that can be done in a way that will avoid, or at best, even reduce the risk of further contagion to Italy and the other trouble spots in Europe? Well, I think they've, they've got to get on with what they said they were going to do, because the markets don't believe. I said to someone you know well, won't get into a name, one of the senior uh, central bank heads in Europe, and his banks have taken a lot of grief recently. And I said to him, you know, you've got to understand that you guys don't have all the time in the world because they're going to attack your banking The markets are going to attack your banking systems as well as the sovereigns because they, they just don't believe. Because the leaders in Europe have got to not, when they make announcements, it's kind of been a joke because you have these joint sessions either personally or on the telephone between Sarkozy and Merkel, and uh, they make all these statements about what they're going to do. They, they don't put a timeline under it. And so the markets will not believe until A, they put a timeline under these announcements, and B, they actually execute on that timeline. And so the markets may be up the last few days because, you know, everyone kind of left here 
optimistic that all the Europeans you talked to said, we're going to get together, we're going to resolve this. But the truth is, until they, uh, you know, the markets see that there's actual timelines here, you're going to have this tremendous volatility that we've been seeing. And each time there's an erosion, I think, in the credibility of the Eurozone. And it, I think it's unfortunate in the sense that you know, Jean-Claude is leaving at the end of October. He'll stay through the, the Cannes summit. But uh, I think you've had fractures as, because they become public. Uh, you know, in the, uh, with Jurgen Stark leaving and, you know, and uh, Axel Weber, et cetera, et cetera. But I think at the end of the day, they've got to get their, their uh, you know, act uh, uh, together. Uh, and of course, in the case of, of the European Central Bank, it's not like the official openness that you've got here with release of minutes, et cetera, which uh, you do in the Fed. And you could see that you've got a hard position of three of the including my friend Richard Fisher in Dallas, of the standing. These are sort of occasional leaks. There's no official minutes that are done. So I mean, everything is not handled well there. But I, so I think that that's what you need. In other words, if you don't have something to say where you can put a timeline behind it and then execute on it, you're better off not to say it. OK, we'll go to the audience. Barry, uh, Barry Carter. Right. Um, yeah, Barry Carter from Georgetown Law School. Um, first of all, I very much enjoyed your insightful presentation, and I, I look forward to reading the book. Um, I had two questions about sovereign debt following up on Fred that go to enforcement. Uh, first question, Greece. Uh, I understand that most of the Greek sovereign debt is subject to dispute resolution under Greek law in Greek courts. And my first question is, why? Did people or the buyers agree to that? Um, second question goes to kind of countries like Argentina and others that are bounders, that they, you know, they don't believe particularly in paying their debt. In the case of Argentina, what year 2000, 2001, they defaulted, they worked out a deal with a lot of people, but others didn't accept it. Argentina owes billions of dollars in court judgments in New York, legitimate judgments. They haven't paid a cent as far as I know. How, as an old debt negotiator, in the future, do you make provisions to protect against the bounders who are not going to pay, uh, no matter what you, you try to do? What new creative ideas do you have to make sure that you can collect on the debt? Well, first of all, and you sound like a lawyer, you're absolutely correct. They're trying to put in solve, you know, it, it collective action clauses uh, in, this new, uh, in this new documentation. I must say the Greeks uh, did something smart uh, this summer. They should have done it earlier. They hired Mark Walker, who's an old veteran, as a number of you know, and we have several lawyers here who have worked on, on, on this area, uh, to advise the Greeks on the documentation. But that is a problem, uh, and they had struggling with that, but the whole idea is to get a, a collective action clauses in there and work around it. We'll see what finally comes out, because you know, the papers aren't out yet. The collateral isn't there because it's supposed to be the, uh, uh, the stability fund that gives the collateral, and we don't have a stability fund uh, recapitalized because they haven't been able to get the 17 votes. As I said, Germany votes on tomorrow, which is key. So we'll have to see how that finally works out. But that's why a number of us were champions of the collective action clauses, which were first put in by Mexico, because I think that's how these things need to be done. Uh, but as I said, we have a lawyer in the audience who's worked both sides of the Atlantic here, but she should be up answering that. I think in the case of Argentina, I would just say that they basically had two restructuring since uh, the default. Uh, the first one, uh, it depends on who you want to believe as to what percentage came into it. They claim they got 50, 60 percent, I don't know. Then they had one more recently. Uh, you know, within the last two years, which picked up some more. And I should have Jacques de la Rosière uh, up here to answer that question vis-a-vis -vis <clears throat> about uh, the claims in New York, and you're absolutely correct. They still stand there, which is why Argentina hasn't been back to the markets. At one time, they were, having their, they were selling their bonds to Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, so, uh, and I think they've been able, because of the commodity boom, over the last few years with China and elsewhere to get through this. But at some point in time, they've got to really work on this 
and I've given my views to the, uh, the present president and her husband, uh, who she succeeded, that they've really got and several central bank heads in, in, in Argentina that they've really got to, uh, you know, work this out and uh, you know really settle these claims and arrangements so they can get back to the markets because Argentina is not always going to face a booming, uh, you know. Uh, <clears throat> commodity export market, and as you know, they've had some recent disco more initial discoveries of, of more petroleum in Argentina, and the comment is, well, that'll take care of it. But at the end of the day, Argentina really has to do that. And what I would mention, the only thing you didn't mention is that Argentina is a member of the G20. And there was a process agreed on the G20 and to have sort of external look at how these countries were managing their economies. Uh, the IMF was, that was one of the duties the IMF was sort of given to monitor that. And uh, so it'll be very interesting to see how that works out with Argentina as a member of the G20. Uh, but I think both of them are, uh, both the Greek issue has, got, has yet to be fully resolved on how they're going to do that. And second of all, in the case of Argentina, I think they, they've got to really do that. And, and uh, like all things in, in time, it'll eventually happen. But as, as you point out, we're going back to 2001 here. Incidentally, on Greece, uh, we're releasing today a new policy brief by Bill Klein. It should be in your material, and I would uh, commend that to you for a, a thorough analysis of the Greek outlook and what may need to be done or not done there, as Bill would suggest. Nancy. Now, here, here we have the, the expert, both sides of the Atlantic, New York, Fed, the uh, Washington Fed, Okay. But better than that, she was my lawyer when I was at Treasury. Uh -huh. She was the international she lawyer. Can't possibly and be that. next to her is Sam, <laughs> Sam Cross, our guide, who has uh, guided us in the initial negotiations when he was executive vice president of international at the New York Fed. So, I mean, you know, this is a power couple in this area. <laughs> well, I live with a national treasurer. What can I do? Um, you mentioned the Brady Bond spill, and uh, as you recall, the, the ability of the banks to really do a, a discounting um, on the Brady Bonds really couldn't happen until bank capital was built up in the money center banks. And they weren't in a, in a position, frankly, to be able to take the hit. So a lot of what was done in the 80s was buying time, which right. is obviously what the Europeans have been trying to do, but the environment's a lot different, exactly. right? And capital moves a lot faster than it did in the 1980s. So the question I have is, how can you even anticipate any kind of a discount uh, in, a, in a further restructuring of Greek debt if there isn't a major effort to recapitalize the banks that are the creditors? Well, I think you're going to have to have uh, whether or not there's, a, you know, they reopen Greece and, and do a larger discount for the banks, you're going to have to have the recapitalization anyway because the market uh, is going to take that into account when they, when, they, when they evaluate the banks. So it's going to happen anyway. And the International Accounting Standards Board has gotten into the middle of this also. So uh, that, will, uh, that will have to happen. One of the things on the Brady Bonds is that uh, the process started when John Reed decided that he was going to take the big, <coughs> big reserve. Uh, to the annoyance of a lot of banks uh, in the United States. Uh, that was the process. And then Angel Gurria, who now heads the OECD, was then the chief negotiator. And he said, well, we've got to recapture that discount from Mexico. And that started the whole, uh, the whole process there. And then all the other banks were forced to take reserves and then start building up uh, capital. But one of the little known things, it all those who worked out, remember, there were three basic options in the Brady Bonds. One was a, uh, a discount on the principal. Another was a major reduction on interest rates. And there was a third one, which was putting in new money. Because even with all the help of the IMF, the World Bank, the Japanese, the, everything else, the, re the Inter-American Development Bank, everybody, uh, there still wasn't enough money to go around. So they, and I had, that was one of the things that I had uh, worked out with Nick and Angel Gurria. We had to have a new money tranche. How do I know? Because City took the new money tranche because, frankly, uh, John Reed and I believed that Mexico was on the right road. And so it, it's difficult to compare. And Nick makes this point. You can't compare the Greek arrangement 
although the market is trying to do it with the, uh, with the Brady plan. Uh, times are different. The whole atmosphere is different. But you put your finger on it. Uh, and that reserve of, of, of John Reed's, and he irritated a lot of his fellow bankers. He wasn't very popular, and people in Washington. But that kind of forced the issue and led up to when Nick could come in and basically securitize the debt, because that's what we had. Uh, you know, it was like, you know, people were saying the widows and orphans and German dentists of the 1920s and 30s, because we have securitized debt. I point out to people that in Uruguay, we'd already Bradyized them, it was securitized. So you can, you know, you can do it. And if they decide to, re to reopen, and I don't know if they will or they won't, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world. They'll find some way, of, you know, uh, around it. But the, the basic thing is let's just get it done. Let's not just keep pushing it off and pushing it off. But Bill, just most of you are too young to remember, but my memory is that it was about five years from the initial Mexican crisis to the time that you and John and City uh, did the big reserving. Exactly. So, on Nancy's point, the, the, the kicking the can down the road brought about five years from what you said in your remarks, you don't think the Europeans have five years. No, the reason is the markets are different. That's why I said we move, the markets move in nanoseconds. I mean, you didn't have that in the, 19, uh, in the 1980s. And, and you also have to remember that the mature economies were in pretty good shape, by and large. I mean, the US had its problem. Paul was fighting inflation, et cetera. But uh, you know, we were still able to do things. And Europe, uh, the United States, and Japan and you have a different world now, and the markets are not going to wait. So I think they've got to come to grips with the various things I mentioned, because the markets now move much more rapidly. And you have new players in the market. You didn't have hedge funds. You had the beginning of some mutual funds. But all of these people in the insurance companies are all involved. In those days, it was just banks. So I could get a group of 12, 14, 15 banks around mm -hmm. the table that represented five, six, seven hundred players worldwide on syndicated loans, and you could do it. Nancy remembers that very well. Today, it's a different world. Well, with the great creditors, I don't think we have that degree of dispersion. And, and the, the, the one thing that you're not seeing is what you see in the But you, you may see that, Nancy, in the future. And of course, uh, the, what I had mentioned earlier that's very different is the ECB is now one of the biggest holders of not only Greek debt, but Irish debt, Portuguese debt. And depending on what happens in, 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 uh, in Spain and in Italy, they may be, become major, major holders there. So it's a different configuration. That's why I say you really can't compare it to the Brady, to the Brady bond situation, which people love to do in the press. I get questions all the time. Well, is this going to be just like the Brady Bond? And I try and <clears throat> tell the members of the press different circumstances, different times, different markets. Bill? Bill, I'd like to push you a little bit on your response to Fred's question about contagion. So I see the problem. Half of the Greek debt now is owned by the public sector. Right. The ECB alone has about 50 billion euros. Or more. Or more. So when people talk about a 50% haircut, you know, they, they tend to think, well, yeah, the banks need to take a hit. But if there's a 50% cut in Greece's debt and it's all in the private sector, it completely wipes out all claims by the private sector. So I don't think that's, well, I guess the question is, if you have to have a really deep haircut for the 50% the that are private holders, what is the uh, contagion effect to Italy and Spain? It seems that's the really key question about this situation. And at the end of the day, it seems if you work through the probabilities and the damage consequences, it's a pretty good bargain for the Germans and others just to, if necessary, take on the whole thing. Uh, because the collateral damage, uh, it seems to me, is potentially uh, very large. Now, there seem to be folks who think you can have really deep forgiveness of the private holdings and that that will then somehow lance the boil and there'll be no contagion to Italy. But I find that considering what happened on the 21st of July, uh, and that those spreads started to go up right at that time with the PSI, uh, the private sector involvement, I find that difficult to believe. So I guess I'm trying to draw you out a bit more on the feasibility of deeper haircuts without causing a, um, an inflammatory contagion. 
Well, uh, and I should say, Bill, there's no economist around who's followed debt restructuring more than Bill has from the very, very beginning in Mexico in 1982. But what I said earlier there is the, the whole concept is all of this paper, and I think you give a low figure because you've got to remember the, the, not only the bonds they bought, but also the collateral bonds they've taken from the Greek banking system, mm -hmm. but the ECB. But the whole idea, original idea, was to take that portfolio and, and shove it in the stability fund which would get the ECB out. But I had mentioned, and you just said it again, it's kind of taking uh, private sector debt and, and making it public debt. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, what the governments have been saying, we don't know if they'll do it or not, is that maybe the collateral that they're going to be putting up for the 21% for the is worth more than the 21%. And if we're going to have to take a hit, and you're right, when you, when you, when you see the contagion effects the Europeans should have stepped right in and taken care of the thing day one. It took them to May to even get out what they did. And then they, they were charging almost usurious rates when you consider the difficult situation to the Greeks. And they, you know, they had them at five, seven years to repay. And uh, you know, they should have extended out to 15, 20 years day one. And so you're right. The price is cheap to solve Greece to cut the contagion. The question is to get the political will and how you do it. Because the answer you would get for many, including a number of the Northern Europeans, is, OK, Bill, we do this. And uh, what kind of example does that set going forward? He said, isn't that kind of like what we in France did by, with Maastricht? And so you've got the other side of it. One person, he hasn't said too much of it, but I guess I can, since he's no longer in the public sector, but uh, a, uh, <coughs> a former head of a central bank, uh, <coughs> It was Axel Weber made a comment to me, at the, and this would be January this year. He said, you know, Bill, one of the things that this may end up in, which is something like what you're saying, he said that maybe Northern Europe really has got to put in something similar. Uh, and that's, uh, I don't know that he originated this idea, but it was a comment he made. Something like either the Marshall Plan that you gave us or he said, more particularly, what West Germany did with East Germany vis-a-vis -vis Southern Europe. But that is very contentious because the economies are very different there, you know, in the sense of Greece, Italy, uh, Portugal, Spain. Uh, I'll tell you the one that I think is probably going to be solved, uh, I think, without that much difficulty, is Ireland because, you know, the fiscal situation isn't bad, unfortunately, for the bondholders or the banks. They're going to have to take a big hit. And I think that's one of the question marks. You put your finger on it. If they're going to do that, let's do it in a more orderly way than they're doing it now. If Europe is going to step in, Northern Europe, on the Greek situation, let's not go through what we're doing now. Because it, as you're, you say, it'll just cause more contagion. Uh, and the markets already disbelieve. Uh, and the expectation levels keep going up. And then they go down. And I'm concerned now, if they really don't come out with something between uh, you know, at least at the end of, uh, of the con summit on this, uh, you could have another real hit to the markets, particularly with the growth rates in Europe. So they've got to come to a resolution here, and uh, one way or the other. And I'm sure that the Northern Europeans, most of them, are going to want the private sector in there on a, on a similar basis. Uh, and obviously, the banks don't want it because the banks think it's, you know, that they've got a good arrangement there. and. Uh, uh, so, uh, when we sat around the negotiating table, uh, you know, I didn't suggest when Angel Gurria on the first Brady deal said, this is a discount we want. Uh, you know, he wanted 30, 40 percent. I didn't say, well, gee, we should have 50 percent. I mean, you know, you're representing the banks and we, we, we got to an agreement. Got someone sitting next to you who knows that well, uh, <clears throat> based on his time in Treasury and at Bank of America at the time, is that, uh, Peter knows this very well. I mean, you tried to work out something which the banks could handle, going back to Nancy's point, on what was feasible for the banks to do uh, and, and yet satisfy the need of the country and the system. And that's what you've got to have here. So we'll see how it uh, works out. But the, the basic thing is you can't delay this stuff forever because the markets move so quickly today. It's not like uh, that we, you know, with the time we had in the 1980s and the 1990s. Bill, you mentioned Nick Lardy's work on China. Nick's got a question. I didn't see you sitting there, Nick. I 
Well, my you, question. I hope you monitored me when I was talking on China. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned uh, the explosion in lending in China in 2009 and the potential challenge that the banks are facing and the fact that they've been raising substantial new capital both last year and this year in part in and the new Basel III requirements. Uh, we put a piece on our China Economic Watch uh, yesterday pointing out that while this is going on, the Ministry of Finance, which is the owner of most of these institutions, is requiring these banks to pay out about 45, almost 50 percent of their earnings in dividends. The average state-owned company is paying out around 10 or 12. So the, the Ministry of Finance is, in effect, taxing them very heavily. At the same time, the, the regulator, the CBRC, is asking them to uh, raise their capital. These obviously working at cross-purposes. Do you see any, how is this going to play out? Well, well I think you expect banks, banks that are as profitable as these banks are, at least temporarily, to be rebuilding their capital and, uh, from retained earnings and not relying on uh, diluting the shareholder, existing shareholders. Well, I think at the end of the day, Nick, and you know this so well, is uh, the, the, the it's, it, this is sort of like, a, a, if you want to say, Chinese never want to have another Tiananmen Square. They never want to have another major bank bailout. And so I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, the well capitalized bank concept is going to work out here uh, because they can't take a chance here. And so I think that's what's, what's eventually going to happen. I agree with you. It's not a congruent policy. But I think at the end of the day, the well-being and the capitalization of the, of the banks is going to win out over this. Let's hope there's not too many problems in the meantime. I mean, it's just like what I said on real estate and the collection, as you know well, uh, from provinces and municipalities. And also this whole, uh, this whole question of the trust companies and shadow banking, et cetera. China can't afford to have that happen again, what, what, what they had to do 10 years ago because of the size of the institutions. So I think that's how it'll have to work out. But as you know, there are going to be substantial changes in the state council in this area shortly. And uh, it'll be very interesting to watch who is going to move into the, some of these slots. I'll just leave it at that. Well, with apologies to Barry, I'm going to give the last question to your good friend and mine, and my vice chairman, George David. Uh, Bill, you said uh, that a fundamental problem in Europe is the substitution of public debt for private debt. And it seems like we have the same problem in the United States to an even greater degree. And you haven't talked much about the U.S. at all. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind just closing with some comments about uh, compares and public debt, U.S. and deficits and where this thing's all going to end. And, and so one specific thing on that, from your unparalleled experience in this business, how does the economic success and policy of the United States affect your ability negotiating as a U.S. banker, uh, but frequently at the head of a consortium of U.S. bankers, on international economic issues like the debt crises? Well, uh, just a quick first answer to the last point. Uh, I'm not doing the negotiation anymore. I'm a <clears throat> I've got my own consulting company, too, and I'm a professor at Brown. They're kidding me that I'm the absent professor because I haven't spent a lot of time there. But, you know, I think that uh, we've put off, uh, you know, taking the necessary steps on the deficit uh, a long time because we had the reserve currency of the world, and I don't think that's going to continue to allow us to do it. And so uh, I think S&P, and everyone criticized S&P, the Secretary of the Treasury, the President, and everything else. But I guess you got to say one thing for S&P. It put a shot right across the bow. And uh, <clears throat> was, you know, if you can't get something coming out of this super committee that has, you know, in the area of a trillion or a trillion two or three, I think you're going to see the other rating agencies maybe change their, uh, their attitudes. And so, I think uh, you're going to have to have movement here. And basically, as you know well, the American corporations are pretty flush with liquidity. And what they don't have is certainty here on regulation. I mean, the bank situation, we, and this is a subject all onto its own, the regulation of banks. Two years ago, the brave new world at the G20 and the uh, Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board is we were going to have a level playing field cooperation, coordination. We're going to eliminate or at least diminish regulatory arbitrage. Well, what I see happening is we could end up with more regulatory arbitrage. 
because every country seems to go, is going to be implementing Basel III in a different time frame. We've got Dodd-Frank here. You've got the Vickers Commission in, uh, in the UK. You have the Swiss with their own regulations. So I asked the head of the Basel Committee, I mean, what was his attitude on this? And he said, Bill, uh, and uh, he said that basically Basel III are minimal standards. Jaime Caruana, who was a great head of the Central Bank of Spain, he kept their banks, their, their major commercial banks out of trouble by allowing no off balance sheet, but he said these are minimal standards. And so <clears throat> I think you have <clears throat> this whole problem of uncertainty within the banks, how this is going to be handled. So you, you have a lot of uncertainty in, in, you know, in the country. You have the point that you made about what's happening uh, you know, to lending policies and you know, public and private debt uh, and the deficit. At the same time, we're in stagnation and we've got to have growth. And I think that uh, it's fair to say even the great proponents of the first stimulus package have uh, say that it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't achieve what they would like to have achieved. <clears throat> and uh, we have the President's jobs bill up there, and I think some of it will get approved, some of it won't. I think the payroll tax thing will probably be, will probably be <coughs> approved. But I think that uh, we've got our own problems here, and uh, they're serious, and they've been covered up by being the world's uh, reserve currency. But <clears throat> I think that we've got to move on these areas. And I'm <clears throat> an optimist by nature, that's how I end my book. <laughs> and I'm an optimist here that when people realize this and they take a look at what's going on in Europe and Southern Europe, and, and some of the examples, uh, take a look at what happened in Japan. And one of the, the, the comments that you hear out of Japan is that on, on, on stimulus only goes so far. And that, you know, the, the, Ch the Japanese, and this is an area that Fred knows well, tried all sorts of stimulus, monetary, fiscal, but at the end of the day, you've got to have the private sector with new investment there. That's the way to draw it in. And you, you've had this tendency to hold back because of the uncertainties, lack of confidence, et cetera. And I think that's what we've got to get back here. So without getting in a political debate. Jo uh Bill, thank you for sharing so much of your uh, enormous wisdom and experience with us. We congratulate you on the book, congratulate you on the more than 50 years, look forward to a couple of decades more at least of your active involvement in all this, and uh, we'll have you back to track it further for us uh, at another early occasion. Well, hopefully not two decades. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Good honor. <laughs> By the way, Nick, I haven't seen that, but I, I know.